excited today to have one of our favorite presenters back, um, Jordan Van Hemert. Jordan doesn't need an, an introduction, but for those of you who might not have uh, been to some of his other classes, he is now the director of jazz studies at the Schwab School of Music at Columbus State University. He's a Van Doren artist clinician and a Selmer Paris saxophone artist. He's also a really active composer and his newest album is called I Am Not a Virus. And it is informed by his political consciousness and addressing issues of race and social justice. Um, it is available on Spotify. And for those of you that still have CDs, you can get one off of Jordan's website. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jordan Van Hemert back to HASP. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to be here um, with you virtually from very sunny and very warm and very humid Columbus, Georgia. Um, I wanna encourage anybody who has questions as the uh, presentation goes on to just feel free to uh, either ask those um, you can unmute yourself and just ask away. Um, or you can, uh, there's a raising hands uh, feature in Zoom that you can utilize with the reactions uh, tool um, like this. Uh, and then you can lower your hand when you're done asking your question. And uh, the, another thing that you can do is put your question in the chat and um, either Ian or I will uh, will get to it that way. Um, but I'm excited to be back here. This is one of I was telling Lynn uh, and Ian. This is one of my favorite things to do, uh, like all summer, because I teach a lot of non majors, uh, and it's great. And I understand like everybody has different reasons for you know being in class, but. It's always nice to teach a class where uh, people are electing uh, to be there and, and whatnot. So um, to start off, we're talking today about modern marbles, which is to say we're talking about the saxophone in jazz today. Um, now, Lynn and I poured over different uh, conversation um, and, and class topics this this time around, and I was just saying, well, what what would people like to to hear about, and what would what would be interesting? And we eventually settled on this, talking about sax the saxophone specifically, uh, and in a modern context. So, um, the saxophone in jazz is really nothing new, and really. What we have is the sac from the saxophone across the decades, we have some of the finest trailblazers uh, in jazz music as the, you know, from its very inception to uh, right in up to this very day. And so you'll recognize names like Ben Webster, Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, and Benny Carter. Of course, the great Charlie Parker. John Coltrane, Cannonball Adderley, and Joe Henderson, and I, I did a class on him uh, when we were talking about uh, composition from 1950 to the present. And what you'll find with the saxophone is that each one of these artists is kind of signaling to uh, the various um, kinds of uh, it's sing they're signaling to the music that something new is coming. So if you think back to the bebop era with Charlie Parker, um, he really was signaling that something new was coming. Um, and, or maybe better yet, he was signaling he was the something new. Uh, and when he kind of crashed onto the scene, um, he brought with him new ideas and, and a lot of fresh um, co musical concepts. Same thing with John Coltrane and, and even back to Benny, uh, Ben Webster and Benny Carter and Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins, they were doing things um, that the saxophone had kind of allowed them to do that were really not being done at that point. And I think it's important to remember that because that trend kind of continues up into the modern era. 
Now, disclaimer, there are many, many talented saxophonists in jazz today, and I would run out of time talking about so many of them. So these sessions are gonna highlight some of them who are notable, but it's impossible to highlight all of those who deserve recognition. Um, this now also note, uh, nota bene, uh, this is a list of saxophonists who are alive today. Um, one noteworthy omission, again, there are gonna be omissions, but one of them is the great Michael Brecker who is kind of deserving of his own class um, for his advancements on the saxophone and, and fusion. These are all musicians who you could go out and hear in New York City or around in venues around the country uh, tomorrow if you wanted. So that's kind of where I decided to keep the focus this time. Um, again, if we're too broad, I find that I'm talking about every saxophonist who's ever lived. And then, and then what happens is uh, I don't really say much about any of them. So. Um, first, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of the saxophone, and I mean like super brief, because we have to talk about kind of where the instrument came from and, and a few little things about the, the mechanics. And some of you might have been in uh, my wonderful friend and colleague, uh, Adam Briggs. He did a um, terrific class, I think, on classical and contemporary saxophone, um, where he may have delved into this. But the saxophone was invented in 1846 by Antoine Joseph or Adolf Sax. Um, the modern voices are soprano, alto, tenor, and baritone. Those are the ones that we play all the time. Um, however, the saxophone was originally invented as to be a bridge between uh, the orchestral instruments. So a bridge between strings, woodwinds, brass, and... Um, to a degree, even a little bit uh, of a bridge uh, with those percussive colors, the mallets, um, but mostly strings, brass, and, uh, and woodwinds. So he wanted to make something that wasn't quite a clarinet, but also wasn't quite a French horn. It could really blend uh, the trumpets uh, together um, and some of the more, uh, I don't wanna say aggressive brass timbres, but, you know, when you hear, like, for example, some of those orchestral <laughs> excerpts um, that my brass playing friends are so uh, fond of playing, like the low brass excerpt for the um, uh, Wagner's The Ride of the Valkyries, um, it has a certain oomph to it. So voices that we don't use today include this, well, we use them, but they're sparingly. Uh, the soprillo saxophone, the sopranino, the bass, and the contrabass. They're popular in saxophone ensembles. And what I mean by that is ensembles of only saxophones, uh, but really honestly, not much else. Unfortunately, dis as, despite his best attempts, Adolf Sax's, uh, desire to make the saxophone into a common orchestral instrument that is as common at, in the symphony orchestra as say the trumpet, uh, his dreams were really not realized. But that's okay because uh, lately there's been some symphonic writing for the saxophone, a lot of it as a more soloistic instrument. Um, John Adams City Noir uh, kind of comes to mind. Um, but then uh, jazz musicians and the concert band and military band tradition grabbed onto the saxophone and that's where we see it the most. So here are some uh, patents uh, for the saxophone. Um, and as, as you see, these are, are quite early. Um, but this is kind of what he had in mind, he uh, some of these early designs um, were called sax horns. Um, and then you see like over here, um, like early depictions of the, uh, the like an early baritone kind of uh, an instrument here. But I just thought those patents are really interesting because um, if you look at the saxophones that are being produced today, 
they look similar to this. They look very similar, but not quite the same. And I think the, you know, metalworking and uh, the craftsmanship that has come uh, to this very day is it's really come quite a long way. So because um, some interesting stuff with patents here. All right. So in terms of jazz. Now, there are a couple of trends. First of all, is that saxophonists tend to specialize in one of the middle voices. Um, every saxophonist kind of has their home instrument. Um, it's just like clarinetists will play the B flat clarinet or the A clarinet uh, in orchestras. Um, and that will kind of, whoops, that will kind of be their specialty. Uh, similarly, um, Saxophonists will choose to specialize in a middle voice, either the alto or the tenor. Now, sometimes there are exceptions. For example, Gary Smolian, Jerry Mulligan, and Ronnie Cuber, they all chose the baritone saxophone. And uh, Jane Ira Bloom and Wayne Shorter, especially Wayne these days, they're really kind of focused on the soprano saxophone. So this is not a hard and fast rule, so to speak, but it's just a trend that kind of emerged. And I think where that comes from, although don't quote me on this, is that when you start in your school band, you're usually playing the alto saxophone or the tenor saxophone. You're not usually playing baritone um, because your, your body as a young person is not ready to support that just yet. Um, and so like band, a lot of band teachers will start students on say the alto saxophone and then allow them to kind of grow into uh, the baritone saxophone. And the soprano saxophone is a whole beast of another ilk. Uh, and it's very difficult to play and especially difficult to keep in tune because the embouchure is so specialized and, and very, um, it's not constricted, but it's a smaller shape and it involves a lot of these muscles here. And, um, so the soprano is a specialized kind of instrument that a lot of people um, play much later in their careers after at least a couple, like three or four years uh, playing uh, the alto or tenor saxophone. Now stemming from John Coltrane and Cannonball Adderley's influence as well as the big band tradition, alto and tenor saxophonists will typically add soprano as an auxiliary instrument in jazz. And then of course, many saxophonists will double on flute or clarinet and that comes straight from the big band era. Um, a lot of times there was, especially in Fletcher Henderson orchestra, um, that early big band that influenced Duke Ellington, you'll see a lot of saxophonists who um, will play clarinet, like the, the first uh, book, um, the first part is usually written for uh, alto saxophone or clarinet or sometimes both but mostly clarinet. So um, it is uh, kind of something that grew out of that big band tradition. So the alto saxophonists who are going to uh, focus on today, again, all artists uh, who you could uh, go out and see a concert or a show at a club. Uh, first from Detroit, Michigan, we'll talk about Kenny Garrett. Uh, then we'll talk about a rising star, uh, Alexa Tarantino, um, and she's got a lot of very interesting uh, albums out right now on the Positone Records label. Then we'll talk about an Indian, Indian American saxophonist, Rudresh Mahanthapa, uh, who's the son of Indian immigrants and just has a really interesting story. And then lastly, we'll talk about uh, Miguel Zanon uh, on the alto uh, saxophone. He is a Guggenheim uh, fellow and a MacArthur Genius Grant winner. Kind of a fun thing to talk about. I, working with saxophonists so often and being one, you don't necessarily think about us as being uh, MacArthur uh, Genius Grants or geniuses of really any kind, but Miguel's uh, kind of on a whole other level. So then we'll talk about tenor saxophonists uh, and we'll talk about Melissa Aldana, who has a really interesting project uh, and is the first female winner of the uh, first female instrumentalist winner of the Thelonious Monk competition. Uh, then we'll talk about Joshua Redman and we'll, we'll close with Chris Potter. Um, throughout, we'll be listening to some examples 
and listening to some interviews and I'll be interspersing my own uh, commentary that I've learned from these great musicians. So, some common themes. Jazz is a music of ancestry. And so in all of these musicians, there's a really deep acknowledgement of the art forms lineage and also their lineage as people. Um, second, as harmony evolves, the rules kind of become a foundation uh, from which freedom is derived. And what I mean by that is that, excuse me, um, what you have is, yes, you have chords, but in, um, you start hearing them being uh, introduced in a lot of non-traditional ways. Uh, and I'll get into that later. Um, melodies such as those from Tin Pan Alley standards, uh, those are really not as common. And as you get more modern, the melodies and the solos, the improvised solos are a little bit more difficult to um, distinguish from one another. You know, if you have a tune like How High the Moon, you know the melody is right off the top and it's usually being sung. And these are, are a lot of, it's a lot of instrumental music and therefore it's a little bit more abstract, um, but still very cool. Uh, we're hearing a lot of influence these days from popular music. Um, and that's really nothing new, I would contend because those Tin Pan Alley standards, that was the popular music of the day. And it was, was something that people were hearing all the time. Then uh, you got into the hard bop era. And in hard bop, they were talking about uh, doo-wop and um, uh, R&B, rhythm and blues, and all of that uh, black popular music of the day. And then of course, after the 1950s, musicians like George Russell, Thelonious Monk, Gil Evans, um, they experimented a lot with classical music and classical forms. Um, different meters, different tempi influences from classical music. And all I have to say there is it's about time because classical music has been borrowing from jazz for a long time. So it, all of these things you'll hear in some of our, um, you won't hear everything in every artist, but uh, I'll be sure to kind of be your tour guide and, and point some out throughout the way. So first uh, it's, we're introducing Kenny Garrett. Now, Kenny Garrett, it was born in 1960 in Detroit, Michigan, and he gained recognition uh, as a member of the Duke Ellington Orchestra in 1978, and it was under the leadership of Mercer Ellington at the time. He played with Art Blakey, Freddie Hubbard, and Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra, just to name a few uh, of the um, incredible acts in New York that he had uh, played with. His first album as a band leader is called Introducing Kenny Garrett, and it was released in 1984. If you do the math there, uh, our friend was 24 years old when he cut that record. Um, he moved to New York basically like right out of high school. Um, and so uh, that's a little bit about Kenny. He was mentored by the great Detroit musician um, whose name is Marcus Belgrave. Marcus is, was a teacher who had basically was, who was um, one of those people who mentored a lot of Detroit musicians. Um, it came about kind of by accident, not by accident, but uh, he had been asked to teach a class for young people. And they then he and the institution that he was teaching for realized that he was really good at it. Uh, and so he has had a history of mentoring uh, Detroit musicians. Um, that lasted literally until he passed away. Um, I want to say it was 2013 when he passed on. Anyway, uh, here's a little bit about Kenny Garrett. And I, I have to remember that my uh, mouse here is far more sensitive. Sorry about that. Um, let's hear from Kenny himself. Thank you. Uh by the way, the subtitles are in French. I promise you the interview, he's speaking English, albeit with a, a French accent. Us, you know, admirers, uh, you're such a complete artist because of the music, because of your aura, uh, the look too. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you. And uh, I am surprised because you went, I think, out of the high school at 18 
Mm -hmm. That's correct. I don't know, but uh, you went straight to Duke Ellington Orchestra. That's correct. Then probably Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, Art Blakey. Well, actually, I was playing when I got to New York. That's when I started working with Thad Jones and Mel Lewis and hmm. Danny Richmond. And I mean, there's a whole list of people. Uh, but that was the start of it, really, just playing the Duke Ellington band after high school. Mm -hmm. the, the story is... Um, there was a second alto player, and he disappeared somehow. Mm -hmm. I guess he decided to go home, which was good for me. <laughs> and uh, they were looking for uh, someone to sub. And my teacher, Bill Wiggins, and another teacher, Marcus Belgrave, they're the pillar of the community in, in Detroit, they recommended me because I was playing in all the bands. I was the up-and-coming saxophonist. And I ended up just supposed to go out for the summer and then it ended up playing with the Ellington band for three and a half years. So you didn't go to college. You didn't go to a university of music, I guess. Well, I, I did go to college, but not the college that most people know. I went to the, the college of Duke Ellington hmm. where we played the music with Duke Ellington. I played with Cootie Williams. I sat under Harold Minerve. Mm -hmm who was a protege of Johnny Hodges, and Norris Turney, who were protégés. So that was a first-hand experience. So it was a college or a university. I went to the University of Miles Davis. I went to the University of Freddie Hubbard and Woody Shaw. So, and played the music with Charles Mingus. So for me, it was a first-hand experience. So it was a university. It just wasn't from the same perspective that everybody is you know, coming from now. What do you think of, of those colleges? Because I think you have a link uh, with Berkeley College of Music, you got a, a degree, honorary degree. Honorary de doctor's degree. Yes. That's beautiful. I heard it was packed. It was packed. It was actually pretty interesting, but I think you know about universities. It's it's. Um, people always ask me, "What do I think about that?" I said, "Well, if you're from a small town, and there's no no musicians, or you're not, you need to be in an environment where you can be inspired." I think for me. I was just fortunate because I got a chance to go with the guys who actually played, mm -hmm. you know, to play that music. So you can't get any better education than that, you know. I mean, I can go to a school and I can play Duke Ellington's music, but not to play it with the music. I played the musicians who played with Duke Ellington. It's just totally different. And they're a little stricter, uh, but they, there was the lead alto player, Harold Minerd, actually took me on his wings, and he taught me about playing the saxophone. He used to talk about something called a bell tone. I'm not sure if you know what a bell tone is. I was uh, playing with him, and he said, um, you have to play a bell tone. I'm like, what is that? And um, one day I was listening to Sonny Stitt, and I heard this sound. I said, that's the bell sound. It's when you, when the, you pop the bell, and it rings. But I never knew what it was at that time. So they were sharing a lot of this information <laughs> that you, you couldn't really get you know, and that's what that's really what I do with my musicians now. Kind of the same thing. I share the information from all the musicians who I play with. You know, so it's uh, it's learning on the bandstand, opposed to learning in a university or a lab, as I call it. I hear uh, when you play. I hear uh, Johnny Hodges, Benny Carter, hmm. uh, Jackie McLean. I hear Miles, hmm. Cannonball, Coltrane, Maceo Parker. Hmm. Uh, would I be close to the truth or? Well, Am I forgetting someone? No, he, well, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of people. There's Hank Crawford, um, there's Sonny Stitt. But, you know, I think the thing for me, I came through all those musicians, but I always, in the back of my mind, because I remember my sister, there was a Gary Bark solo on um, a tune with Phyllis Hyman. It might have been Betcha My Daughter in Law. And uh, she said, Well, can you play that solo? And I said, I can play it, but I want to play my own solo. So I tried, I played a little bit of his solo and then I played my own solo. And there was another solo with uh, Angela Bofield, who was an R&B singer from New York. And Eddie Daniels played a, a, a solo on that, tennis solo on that. And my sister wanted me to play that solo. But I never wanted to play anybody else's solo. I wanted to play my own solo. And I think at a young age, I don't know where that came from, but that was kind of there for me. You know? But there were so many people, I mean, like I said, who influenced me. There were a lot of tenor players. I mean, you name Coltrane. There was Sonny Rollins. There's uh, Johnny Griffin. I mean, Stanley Turrentine. 
I mean, it's, it's just a list, you know, because my father played tennis, so Macy O. Parker. I discovered recently you mm -hmm. are from Detroit mm -hmm. and uh, Mackenzie High School. You, you Mackenzie you High School, that's you correct. You went there. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I saw on one of your last album mm -hmm. uh, the tune Detroit, very nice, mm -hmm. with the vinyl, vinyl sound. Okay. The scratch sound at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then I saw a lot of um, references. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, musicians, actually, okay. a lot of uh, Hi, uh, Haynes here. Is it for Roy Haynes? Yeah, that's from Seeds from the Underground, but that was for Ray, Roy Haynes. That was actually right after I performed with um, the Five Piece Band and then the Freedom Band. Uh, both of those bands were with Chick. So that experience offered a lot of um, different approaches to music. Um, Chick and John McLaughlin, they were writing a lot of odd meter. And I started to hear a lot of odd meter, so I started to, to write it in, in my, my songs. And also, in the Freedom Band, I was playing Roy Haynes, and um, I always wanted the drummer to have a shout chords behind him. You know, like this kind of lifting up the drum. So I wrote this tune, Haynes, here, which we play, and then it, you know, on the record we played it one way, Live, we can open it up and you know get to a different vibe, you know. And being from a cinquante-cinq. So that's an interview with Kenny Garrett, and then he was talking about the University of Miles Davis. Uh, and honestly, I think this is a really interesting uh, approach. Um, he does sound like he has been influenced by a lot of tenor saxophonists, even though he plays the alto saxophone. Um, and I've always found that really interesting about Kenny's playing. Um, here he is with Miles Davis, uh, the University of Miles Davis, as, uh, as he calls it. Um, and I want to bring up the first thing, if you'll notice where my cursor is, he's really pushed in very far on the cork. And something that that does is um, the saxophone, um, where you are on the cork controls your intonation. Um, well, it's one of many factors. What it controls is the length, uh, length of the instrument. And you can make the instrument longer by pulling out on the cork and shorter by pushing in. And what that does is, is it's the lower the longer and the shorter the sharper. So uh, if you're pushed way in, the pitch will go up. If you're pulled way out, the pitch will go way down and it'll be flatter. Something that's really interesting is that Kenny's pushed in way further than a lot of people are uh, on the saxophone. Um, typically you have it about maybe an inch or a half inch of, of cork that you can see, um, but he's pushed in really, really far. And what that means is that in order to compensate for that, saxophone is all about equilibrium. And what he does is he, um, that means that he's playing with a really open throat position and a really low tongue. And what you hear in that, what it does is it makes a sound, um, <clears throat> you hear more of the fundamental overtone, you hear more of the, um, like the width and body of his sound. And uh, so this is Kenny with Miles Davis, Human Nature. I'm gonna let them play a little bit of the melody and then I'm gonna skip to Kenny's solo.
All right, so here's Kenny Garrett's solo. We'll go to the beginning so you can kind of see how he builds it. And what I love is that he and Miles are really communicating visually, and I think you see that. Oh, shoot. <laughs> So this is kind of an era in fusion where they were um, going over like the same chord for a long time. And what that does is it builds tension and it allows the soloist to develop a solo. So you heard him playing just a few notes at the beginning, playing with Miles, playing with the guitar player, really communicating a lot visually. Um, and, and you heard him just play a few notes there and he developed it into something much, much more. So that was something really cool that I think is actually a, a characteristic of Kenny's playing. And he, he does that. Um, most of his solos, uh, when you listen to his music, they are on, a bit on the longer side. But it is kind of really cool to see how he can just begin with a few notes uh, and, um, and really kind of bring something out of the musicians who are around him. Um, next, I, I want to play a track of his. Uh, and um, you'll you'll hear this, but you won't see it necessarily. This is from Spotify, um, and I have a playlist that I'm going to share at the end of the, the class here. Um, and this is a tune called Hargrove. And what I really love, this is dedicated to Roy Hargrove. And um, what I really love about this is, is all of Kenny's music has this beautiful groove to it. Um, a lot of it is in 4-4 four, four time. But what he's doing is um, like he's using the grooves 
um, in, in different ways. And so you'll hear this uh, tune here. This is called Hargrove by Kenny Garrett. So you hear that this melody is developed over a really long time. There's a lot of repetition to it, which is another thing that Kenny is really kind of known for. Um, and you notice that all these textures are being layered in. So you hear um, in the beginning, it's, it's saxophone and trumpet and uh, the rhythm section. But then later on, vocal is kind of layered in and it's really interesting and very beautiful, I think. Um, so that's one of my favorite uh, things here about um, Kenny's, uh, Kenny's music. And uh, frankly, it is one of the things that I think really makes his music interesting. And the repetition allows you to latch onto a melody, um, which is one of my favorite things. His music is really approachable. Um, and yeah. So um, next, we're going to talk about Alexa Tarantino. Um, Alexa is, oh, shoot, there we go. She was born in 1992 in West Hartford, Connecticut, and her performance credits include the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, the Diva Jazz Orchestra, Cecile McLaurin Salvant, um, five critically acclaimed albums as a leader. Uh, she was the 2021, 2020 and 2021 Rising Star uh, from the Downbeat Critics Poll, and she was on Jazz Time's uh, top five alto saxophonists of 2019. Um, so somebody who's doing a lot of really great work, something really cool about Alexa is that she um, is very passionate about education. So with Jazz at Lincoln Center, she is part of the educational division and she does a lot of teaching for them, uh, but her passion for teaching came uh, much earlier. Uh, and she had a lot of teachers uh, who kind of instilled in her the importance of teaching and travels all around the country uh, to teach. Um, so not only is she an incredible performer, but she is a, a wonderful teacher. Um, Alexa's music sounds a lot like um, the standard jazz repertoire, uh, but something interesting about her is that she is an incredible woodwind doubler. Uh, she plays um, alto and soprano saxophone, clarinet, flute, and alto flute. And I even think she plays on Cecile McLaurin Salvant's uh, most recent record. She plays a little bit of piccolo. Um, incredible woodwind doubler. This is her version of a Kurt Vile tune. Uh, it's called My Ship. Um, it's one of my favorite ballads uh, to play and uh, to listen to. And she's playing alto flute on this track. Um, this is from one of her more recent releases. It's called Clarity.
wonderful, wonderful music. Um, really one funny. of definitely one of my favorite saxophonists, but also one of my favorite uh, flute players. Um, this is another tune from that same record. It actually precedes this. This is a tune called Thank You for Your Silence. Um, and I was talking to Alexa about this tune. Uh, and if I can find it, I'm going to share with you a, a clip of the interview uh, that I did with her. But it basically, um, this tune is really unique because of all the grooves that it goes through and all the different grooves that the rhythm section sets up. You'll hear particular, particularly the drummer Rudy Royston is doing a lot to kind of play around um, the melodic content and a lot around the harmony. So um, this is called Thank You for Your Silence. So you can hear this really upbeat groove uh, that's being framed by particularly, like I said, the drummer Rudy Royston uh, and just expertly, expertly, wow. Um, so this is an interview that I did with Alexa um, and I'm just stopping my share and resharing here uh, so that you can all see this video. Um, and I'll let Alexa kind of tell you about herself in her own words. Music. So Let's see. Um, you have the teenager, you have a playlist that you listen just because it's not possible, you know, for so long. That's so true. yeah, that was the, that it is. And remember that it is a snap. Releasing three records. So yeah, um, uh, let's see. I think I asked her about what, how she feels about later oh. after the fact, the saxophonist, please join me in putting your virtual hands together, especially following such a trying era with, with all of these, with some incredible, um, groups such as the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra and, um, if I remember correctly, Cecile uh, McLaurin Salvant. Um, so, can you tell us about first to just kick it off? How has it? How is it feeling to be touring and performing again, uh, especially following such a trying era with with all of these COVID era restrictions? It really feels amazing. It's it's um it's such a great reminder of how the music connects people and brings people together. You know, for so long, we were all isolated, and I think just doing our best to maintain that energy with listeners and with audience and fans and venues and all of that, uh, the whole community really. And I think that the jazz community really did an amazing job of staying connected and supported through COVID. Um, the music community at large, really, but there's just something so intangible about the actual energetic connection when playing live in venues for people that want to be there and, and, you know, are coming to see you and just to have that mutual respect from performer and audience member is really incredible. Um, so it's really, it's really been such a gift to get back out there. Um, and especially with Winton and Cecile, who are two just, you know, Winton's an incredible mentor and hero of mine, and Cecile's one of my best friends. So I just feel very, very lucky. Um, and they, you know, all these groups, the, the, the musicians and the leaders all just inspire me to be a better player and a better person in general. And so um, it's 
why I'm, I'm so happy to be here speaking to the saxophone community. So that's a little bit about Alexa Tarantino, again, resuming touring uh, after quite a hiatus um, due to COVID cancellations. And I think, you know, she echoes a lot of things that we're all feeling right now and, and how lucky we feel to be able to continue to share music. Um, next, uh, we are going to go ahead and carry on with Rudresh Mahanthapa. Now, Rudras is a really interesting character because he is um, somebody who was born in Italy, actually, and he kind of grew up in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, this was due to his dad's academic job, um, which is a kind of a life that I know quite well. Um, uh, being an academic, not my dad's an academic, he's, he's not. Uh, he released a 1997 record uh, with Vijay Iyer uh, called Architectures, um, not architecture, but architecture, like textures, um, because jazz musicians just can't really resist a good pun um, or frankly, a bad one. Um, so like I said, he is the son of Indian immigrants and he teaches at Princeton University. He's a very interesting musician because his concept um, takes a lot of elements of Indian music uh, and a lot of elements of pop music that he was listening to and fuses them together. And you would think that these are kind of disparate things. Like you would think that they would not go together, uh, but he makes it work. And I'm so excited to share uh, one of his most recent projects with you, uh, which is called the Hero Trio. Uh, this trio is alto saxophone, bass and drums. And um, that's the, actually the instrumentation, excuse me, the instrumentation of my latest record, um, except for my record is tenor saxophone, bass and drums. Uh, but it comes out of a very rich tradition, uh, you know, pioneered by so many jazz musicians, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so this is a really cool uh, take on the Stevie Wonder classic, Overjoyed. And, um, uh, I'll play uh, maybe uh, just clips of a couple cuts from this record because um, it, it is so good. Here is Overjoyed by Rudresh Mahanthapa from the Hero Trio record. So something right away that you hear uh, is that he's preserving the original melody and he's playing on saxophone that original piano intro uh, that Stevie does so beautifully. Something that's really interesting to me about his treatment is that it's not in 4-4 four, four time. So Stevie's version is in 4-4 four, four, ba 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 you know and it feels very symmetrical it feels very even. Rudresh's version is in odd meter, and that's something that's really interesting about um, his, uh, his uh, kind of treatment of this tune, but I still think it feels really natural and, and 
his treatment, it doesn't feel awkward. It feels just very elastic, uh, which is something I, that I really, really love about it. Um, now, uh, we're gonna hear Rudresh talk about, well, himself. Um, and he's going to tell you about how he feels musically um, getting to know who he, he is. Oh, shoot, come on, man. Sorry, I'm come on manning myself because I keep hitting a, a button on my keyboard simultaneously with scrolling on the mouse, which is again, like I said, very sensitive. Sorry about that. All right, so this is from a- you know, Depending on the population, interview. that they don't have access to black culture or, right? Everyone's playing jazz, everyone's making their own jazz. that he did with the classical prism saxophone quartet. So jazz has this international scope, right? Everyone's playing jazz, everyone's making their own jazz. But there's always kind of this lurking intimidation of, you know, depending on the population, that they don't have access to black culture or black American culture. So there's a bit of a sinking feeling that their jazz is not authentic. and. You know, that's an interesting issue for me and, and an interesting thing raised to me by others because, you know, I'm not black and I'm not white and I'm not Latin. And, you know, I came through to this music through a lot, a lot of the jazz rock fusion, you know, or our kind of instrumental soul R&B, like people like Grover Washington and David Sanborn and the Brecker Brothers and the Yellow Jackets. And because that was music that also sounded like the music that was being played on Top 40 radio. I was born in 1971. I'm, I'm really a child of the 80s in, in many ways. Um, so that music all made sense. It wasn't like I was listening to Charlie Parker when I was 10 years old. You know, there were plenty of times where I felt like I didn't belong because of the, the color of my skin. And the industry had no place for me either. You know, they didn't know what to do with an Indian American jazz musician. <laughs> A friend of mine was like, why don't you come to Chicago? You know, it's a very healthy scene. You probably play a lot and work a lot, get a lot of experience. And, and it was a great stepping stone to New York because I got a lot of experience and exposure, but more experience than I would have if I'd come to New York. I'd probably be temping. I'd probably be an expert in Photoshop now if I'd moved to New York, you know? And there I really got to play, you know? And I had a steady Monday night gig. I was writing music. A, a little local label put out my first album. You know, like, um, and I knew stuff. I learned stuff. I learned how to get a gig. I learned how to get a radio station to play your music. Like, um, I learned a lot of business stuff. And then every band that was coming through from New York, I went to meet them and would take them out for South Indian food or cook for them or something. So. When I moved to New York, I knew all these people. Like, oh yeah, you're the guy who took us out for Idlis and Doses. I was like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> Here's my CD, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I was think always thinking about the music and the business together because I saw in some sort of maybe subconscious way that the industry was, I mean, I didn't predict MP3 and the internet and piracy, but I knew that stuff was gonna get harder and harder. It was very clear to me. And the schools are turning out so many uh, proficient musicians, you know, there's a lot more to wade through to make sure you are heard, especially if you have a real personal voice. Should be pretty clear that Rudras kind of comes out out of the uh, avant-garde uh, tradition and that's how he accesses this music just wanted to put that out there in case uh that sounded very different uh than his hero chero record
now it's more in the, in my DNA. I have to say, like those first things with Indo-Pak Coalition or or Kinsman, which was this collaboration with with the Carnatic saxophonist Kadri Gopalnath. I think when I look back on that stuff, even though it's like only seven years old, eight years old, is I felt like the feeling I had was that I was trying to prove something, you know. I don't know if it comes across in the music, but when I go to those headspaces, I'm like, oh yeah, I felt like you have to play like this because you're trying to prove that you can do all these things. And now I'm like, you know what? They're so embedded. They're just, they're just coming out now, and I can relax with it. That's always going to be me. Very interesting player and definitely a very interesting philosophy uh, on the music. Our next kind of topic of conversation, uh, and I hate to call a person a topic, but you know, here we are. Um, this is Miguel Zanon. Um, sorry, I'm missing an accent over his O um, in his name. Sorry about that. Um, but this gentleman was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, his music combines, to me, my ears, the work of Charlie Parker and other jazz greats and the traditional music of Puerto Rico. And it's very interesting to hear him fuse those things. Uh, so this is Miguel talking about his sound. Uh, and his sound is something that he's really known for. He's been playing the same mouthpiece for like 20 years. Uh, and that is notable because saxophonists, uh, we are kind of gearheads and we're always looking for the next best instrument or mouthpiece or whatever. And um, the, here's a guy who's been playing the same thing, kind of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And his idea is play the same equipment and find who you are on that equipment and get that sound. Uh, and, and so we're going to hear him talk about his sound a little bit. Again, the subtitles are in French. He is not speaking. <laughs> Uh, about sound, I have sort of a pretty particular way of thinking about sound, um, which has developed over time. I didn't really think about it this way uh, uh, at the beginning of the stages of, of my development, but uh, it has definitely become uh, my number one priority. I would say over the last couple of decades. Uh, early on in my early 20s when I went to school and when I was sort of developing, I spent a lot of time on the instrument, working on technique and, you know, once I started playing jazz, working on that aspect and creativity and language and many different things. Uh, and it wasn't until I finished, you know, I, I finished going to college that I started thinking seriously about, uh, you know, what it meant to be able to produce a, a quality sound and all it took, what it took to uh, be able to do so. Um, and ever since then, it's pretty much been my number one, the number one thing that I work on. And I think about sound in two different, sort of like there's two different parts of it. So there's the physical aspect of the sound, which means uh, the way we use our bodies uh, to produce a sound. Like in the case of the saxophone, there's very specific parts of our body, our diaphragm, our lungs, our oral cavity, uh, et cetera. And, and we need to learn how to use those things. You know, I mean, it's not like we use our diaphragm or oral cavity in every, you know, sort of like everyday activities. They're very specifically uh, used in combination in this case, in my case, I guess. To, uh, to play the saxophone. So I need to be able to recognize certain things, how certain things feel, how to make parts of your body react to certain situations uh, to be able to produce a quality sound. And it took me a while to, to figure this out, you know. But nowadays, a lot of what I practice is basically keeping myself fit, you know, keeping myself in shape so that I can respond to the instrument, you know, and the instrument is not sort of like holding me back in, in a way. The other part of the sound, the other side of it, is of course personality. Now personality is uh, anything that has to do with, you know, uh, uh, timbre, articulation, uh, 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 nuance, attack, all those different things, uh, uh, vibrato, you know, uh, all, these, all these little things that sort of make a sound have a personality. Um, now, I, I really feel that they, these two things, they, they sort of need to go hand in hand, 
But you can't really have the personality if the physical aspect of the sound is not taken care of, you know? So I could be, you know, thinking about, you know, the way I want my sound to, to be produced and the kind of personality I want. But if I'm not able to control all the, the basic elements of how to produce that sound physically, it's going to be really hard for me to achieve that personality. So uh, I, I, when I usually talk about this, I, 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 I make a point on saying, you know, make sure, that, make sure the physical part of it is taken care of. And then the personality thing is just going to come naturally, you know, by listening and, and kind of infusing the sound with your influences and the stuff that you like. So that's Miguel Zanon uh, on his sound. And this is, he has a lot of very interesting projects out. I wish I could play his entire disc discography uh, for you. Um, unfortunately, we don't, we don't really have time for that. Uh, but I'm going to uh, play a couple of cuts for you. This one is called uh, Silencio. Um, it is from his uh, Puerto Rican songbook album. It's called Alma al Dentro. Um, and again, this is all going to be on a Spotify playlist that you can uh, refer to later. Um, if nothing else, I can uh, screenshot the playlist. Some of you all might not be on Spotify, and that's cool. Um, I can screenshot the playlist and then send it off, and then you can like Google or, or find uh, the music in, in other ways. So here's Miguel Zanon playing Silencio. Um, now, this instrumentation is really interesting. You'll hear a lot of different woodwinds. It's not your typical like jazz uh, quartet record. That's one of the things that makes it fun. So you hear a lot of these, uh, what it's cool to me is like, it's like the Puerto Rican groove, um, you know, a lot of um, influence of like, uh, you know, Afro-Cuban music, but then that's mixed with uh, this seemingly like orchestral colors. So it sounds really, really cool uh, in my opinion. Um, that's, I, I was so excited to share that with you today. This is a tune that's a little bit more on the traditional side. Um, and you'll hear that it's called Esta Plena. Esta Plena me alegra el corazón. Esta Plena me brinda satisfacción. Con el requinto y el seguidor. Y esta melodía hago la combinación. Esta Plena me alegra el corazón. Esta Plena me brinda satisfacción.
So some really, really cool colors in there. You hear the, a lot of the percussion up front uh, with the singing, like the vocals. Um, and that really kind of fades into some really very interesting writing for jazz uh, quartet. Um, from Santiago, Chile, uh, the first female instrumentalist to win the Thelonious Monk uh, International Jazz Competition um, is Melissa Aldana. She was inspired by Sonny Rollins, Jimmy Heath, and Mark, Mark Turner. Uh, her latest release is called 12 Stars. It is on the Blue Note label um, and the famous Blue Note label. Uh, this is Melissa talking about her album um, Visions, which was written for uh, the great Frida Kahlo. Uh, and we'll listen to a snapshot from Visions before we close. My name is Melissa Aldana, I'm from Santiago, Chile, half Canadian as well, and I play tenor saxophone. I used to be really in love, I'm, I'm still very in love with the work of Frida Kahlo. I was always amazed by the colors and, you know, like the message behind the her painters, you know. And, I always thought since I was uh, such a young kid that her paintings were very personal, you know. So I didn't know much about her as a woman or her story, but I was really drawn by, by how she expressed herself, you know. So I would take some paintings and just imitate them, you know. But it was kind of like a hobby that I had aside from practicing the saxophone. I never really thought of Frida again until I got commissioned by the Jazz Gallery at Jazz Club in New York, you know. I mean, she's always been in the back of my mind, but I, I never thought of doing something, anything related to, to her or her work, you know. So when I got the commission, um, I wanted to find uh, some kind of source of inspiration, you know, um, aside from what I've been working uh, my whole life. And I wanted to write music inspired on her and some of the paintings, you know, and some of you know, I came up with some fiction stories as well, you know, and I was wondering how, how can I write music inspired on an actual story or in a character, you know. For example, um, the second movement of the suite is called Diego. And I was thinking about how can I express through music um, the idea that I have of this uh, lover of Frida. That's how the suite uh, came alive, you know, like slowly by reading about her life, watching the movie, docu documentaries, about getting really immersed into who Frida Kahlo was, besides the, the painter that I was always just amazed by, you know, really understanding where she was coming from. I started writing the music and that's how the sixth movement came alive. <laughs> More than the paintings itself, like what really inspired me from Frida is this process of self-acceptance, you know, whatever, whatever that meant, you know, and a lot of her paintings are, I mean, most of her paintings are coming from that. Just accept who you are and embrace that through art, you know, like what does it mean to be beautiful or, or being a feminist or feeling a certain way in a certain place. And also the different layers of life, you know. And I think that a lot of the music was really with that, you know. If, you know, it doesn't have the typical AA form uh, that a lot of just standards have, you know. It's just like kind of like a long story with different, uh, with interludes, with different, you know, different textures, um, a lot of counterpoints where everyone in the band is bringing like a new idea and there's a lot of layers of conversation happening, you know. So that is, that's who kind of what I took from her art into the way that I was writing. I hope that we will be able to make them feel something, you know. The idea to have the whole uh, visual element is to try to express where this suite was inspired and what are the questions that I'm asking myself, you know, even though it's not, it's not real, it's not a real answer, you know, but just to make them reflect into who are we as a society, you know, how we connected, how we all go through the same things, you know, like for example, love, what love means, you know, like being with somebody as a, as a female, I think that, or the theme of family, you know, where are we coming from, like what does it mean to be beautiful, what does it mean to be accepted. So I'm hoping that the visual element will give them a better idea to reflect into these different questions that I have about life and self-identity.
incredible musician. Uh, we'll close the kind of talking-ish portion uh, by playing a cut from that record um, from the Visions album. And she talked about the second movement, which was not quite what I was um, planning on playing, but I thought it might be nice to do, uh, considering she did mention it. So give me just a second here. Um, as Gershwin said, life's best when you improvise, and sometimes you improvise uh, even the, the you know plans that you may have had. So, um, okay, here we go. This is, oh shoot, where is that? conclude right now the uh, presentation portion of this. We'll pick up uh, there for next week. Um, but I just wanted to know, does anybody have any questions either about the artists uh, who I've been talking about or any of the music you heard today or really anything in general related to uh, the modern saxophone? I'm just wondering uh, if we could kind of close the time kind of in dialogue together. You can go ahead and type your question into the chat, or you can feel free to unmute and uh, grace us with your with your voice and asking the question yourself. Either one is fine. And I promise I do not bite. So there you go. Jordan, are these people touring at the present time that we could look them up and see where they would be appearing? Absolutely, they are. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to share this particular slate of artists uh, with you is because at any given moment you could sit, you could type Melissa Aldana tour into Google and it would spit out a bunch of dates uh, that where you could see her. Um, and she tours, particularly Melissa tours worldwide. So um, she may be in Europe at various times, but she does a lot of stuff around the States too. So 
yeah, that was one of the primary motivations uh, for this again. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said before, it was a pretty significant omission uh, to omit Michael Brecker, um, but I wanted it to be a whole slate of artists uh, that you can hear from uh, in this day and age and go and see. Uh, and I also wanted, wanted to say like, Michael might get his own class uh, down the road. So, yep, absolutely can go and see those artists. Anyone else have any questions for Jordan? Uh, Jordan, how, how much classical training might any of these people have? Some, you know, had really nice vibrato and, you know, kind of that mellow sound that you often hear. And I noticed that the uh, Rudresh was playing with Prism uh, the well-known saxophone quartet. So even, I mean, I, I see um, I, Alexa is an Eastman grad, but in jazz performance, but do most, would most of them have started out with some classical training first? That is an excellent question. And the answer is that it's a mixed bag. So Joshua Redman never studied classical music um, until later in his life. Like he studied classical music like after he became a professional musician, he started being like, oh yeah, maybe I should go in and like, you know, do some of this stuff. Um, uh, Alexa most certainly studied classical saxophone and um, uh, she had a classical teacher at Eastman. Um, I think she studied with Chen Quan Lin, who's the uh, major saxophone professor at Eastman. Um, some of these musicians, um, I will say that maybe not everybody studied it directly, but every study of the saxophone includes the same elements. Um, and when we talk, when Miguel was talking about sound production, like the things you have to do to, to physically to get a quality sound on the saxophone, a lot of those things are the similar, are the same or similar. And so I think what you find is, and Rudresh actually is another interesting case because. Rudresh plays in a way like the angle of his instrument as like the opposite of Kenny Garrett. Like for Kenny Garrett, if like this is um, Kenny, like his instrument is up here and then Rudresh is kind of down here. And this is where a lot of classical saxophonists will kind of play. Um, so uh, it, it's a really interesting question. And I think a lot, a lot of them would, um, but I know, for example, like Joshua Redman has never uh, never studied classical music formally, uh, but it is something that he studied on his own. And I would suspect this, you know, the same of anybody who hadn't necessarily studied formally, that they would uh, kind of find a lot of ways to incorporate that into their music. And, and Rudras particularly, I think, has like a really rich uh, classical um, background. And Miguel actually did a project with PRISM as well. He's on their Heritage uh, Evolution uh, huh. series. So great question. Thanks, Sarah. I hope that all of you have next week's uh, second session of the class on your calendar. And the nicest part about next week is that Jordan will be here live with us in the HASP classroom. Uh, we will continue the hybrid for those of you that can't make it to the classroom. But if you'd like to come to the classroom, Jordan will be there and he will be performing for us. So that's an, an extra bonus that we get with this class. So anyone else have any questions? If not, thank you very much, Jordan. We just love having you back with us and we'll see you next week. All right, thank you everybody. Nice to be here this morning and uh, look, hope to see many of you next week. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>